Good evening, Mr. Naidu. Thank you very much for joining us. So it's really interesting, actually, this study and how it may contribute to us being able to identify hotspots of the virus. We do know that COVID-19 um, can be picked up in, fe in feces and in wastewater. Can it spread that way as well, so in a similar manner to the way cholera spreads, for example? Um, good evening and good evening to the viewers. No, it's highly unlikely. Uh, highly unlikely. Although live uh, coronavirus have been found in isolated cases in the feces of infected people themselves, we have not found the same in the wastewater. And in fact, in the wastewater, we're not looking for the live virus at all. We're looking for the RNA fragments uh, that I found in the wastewater. Because the wastewater dilution factor is a very significant factor. And this is a very short-lived virus. Uh, so the, the chances of it surviving in low concentrations is very, very limited. Okay, well, that is some comfort at least. Um, so you say it's not the actual virus you pick up in the wastewater, but it's the RNA. Um, so in other words, fragments of the actual the cells, really. Tell me how that works. Well, uh, the technique that is used is a PCR technique. So for the scientists who are watching, they will be very familiar with this. It's a polymerase chain reaction technique that picks up the small quantities of the fragment and then amplifies it. And in amplifying it, it gets to the level where you can actually get a signal and detect it. Now, the reason why this is usually attractive, and it's South Africa is launching our chapter of this, but there are some programs that have started elsewhere in the world as well, and I'll tell you about them, is that, one, uh, it gives you a community-level indicator. This is not an individual-level indicator. And as you said in your introduction, it gives you an idea where the hotspots are. And the first thing that we want uh, to achieve with this is that this serves, if you like, as a triage mechanism so that the health teams will then know where the concentrations are to move in with the actual on-the-ground teams to do the, the formalized testing in those places. The second thing is that we want to monitor what the impact of the interventions are. Uh, this is part of the long-term surveillance project with the pandemic. So hopefully what we're going to see is as the heating up goes, you will have that reflected in the wastewater samples. And then as the interventions start working steadily and we start bringing down the pandemic, we can monitor that as well. So have you already started? How quickly will this be up and running? How quickly is it going to make a contribution? Because it sounds like it means you don't have to do the randomized testing that you can actually, uh, as you say, as soon as you realize an area has got a, a, a suggestion of the virus, you can then hone in on that area and really understand who's been impacted by it. It's exactly that. It's exactly that. And uh, we are now in the first of three phases. In this phase, uh, which goes on for the next two and a half weeks, we're doing the proof of concept. We're getting the methodology right. We're ironing out the kinks in the standard operating procedures. And this is where our international collaboration becomes really, really important. Uh, we're part of a coalition called the GWRC, and these are 14 other WRC-type institutions around the world. And several of us are trying to do this simultaneously. So we're comparing methods, we're comparing operating procedures, we're even uh, starting to talk about exchanging results. So by the end of these three weeks, we should have that procedure. The next phase is to deal with three pilot hotspots. Uh, for now, we're looking at the Western Cape, Gauteng, and KwaZulu-Natal. And after that, uh, we should be able to roll out countrywide. And, and how, how um, macro or micro is it going to go? I mean, would you literally go and test the sewage works of an area or would you literally test a, a nearby stream, for example, in a rural area? How, how do you choose those specific spots? We're going to start with the, the influent into the wastewater works uh, because this is the easiest place to start. And also, in the standard testing procedures that we currently conduct around the country, we are doing this in several places already to look for other things. So we have a, a sample history. And as soon as we get the indicator of a high signal in a particular place, then the second phase will have to kick in. Hmm. This is where you're going to have to go beyond the wastewater treatment works, upstream of that, to try and identify exactly which communities are, in fact, at the risk of very high infection. It sounds like a, so it, it sounds like a fascinating uh, study, and it's, it sounds like it's almost ready to go live and that it's going to actually happen. I can't 
let you go without asking you about water and sanitation and schools. Yes, of course, we know that the minister is hoping to start the phasing in of schools from the 1st of June. We know that there are some 3,400 schools, I think, in South Africa that don't have adequate sanitation. The minister is saying, look, mm. we're making a plan, we're getting the water tankers. It's all going to arrive on the just-in-time system, which is a way of delivering things literally just in time. It's a well-known uh, methodology. Mm. Mm. Um, however, principals polled by the five teacher unions are very concerned about readiness. How concerned are you? Well, this is where we're at. Uh, the, on the waterfront, uh, this should work very well indeed and very quickly because we've already done that uh, in the water sector for the pandemic as a whole and have actually deployed some 19,000 tanks around the country and a further three to 5,000 is going to be rolled out in the schools and part of the 19,000 were in schools already. So on water security, this should be achieved, this should be achieved fairly rapidly. The sanitation is a much more difficult problem. And this is something that the president personally has started tackling last year when he launched a program called SAFE, which is sanitation appropriate for uh, education. And what we're looking at now is a catalyzing of that rollout. We're using existing systems and sewage systems where they're appropriate and where they're not, we're plugging in some powerful new technologies, uh, which we're drawing down from the reinvent the toilet program that the Gates Foundation is running. It will take a little bit longer than the water provision, but the end result of this should be that we have every single school in this country with adequate water and safe sanitation, hopefully not in the too distant future. Can you give me a time frame? I, I can't exactly. Uh, I think that in the urban environment, this is a matter of a few months. In the outlying areas in the rural environments, it might take a little bit longer than that. But I, I'm hopeful that in 2020, one of the benefits we're going to get from this pandemic is universal access to water and sanitation in this country. We have to do it. Absolutely, we do. Thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. That is Desiga Naidu, the CEO of the Water Research Commission.